Welcome to worship with the First Baptist Church of Middletown, Kentucky. My name is Jim Cobbin, and I'm the pastor here at First Baptist, and we are delighted to welcome you into our living room. We want you to get your Bible and read along with us as Lisa reads in the second chapter of Luke. We want you to sing with us and pray with us and open your hearts to what the Lord has to say to all of us today. Today, our message will be done by both me and Reverend Susan Bowles. Susan is our minister of children here at the church. She's a graduate of Carson Newman University and holds a Master of Divinity from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Today is her inaugural sermon, and I know she would appreciate your prayers for her as she opens the word of the Lord together with me for us all to hear. Let's pray together. Our Father, how grateful we are for the blessing of worship, of hearing and reading Holy Scripture, of singing and praying. How grateful we are for the women that you call into ministry, and today especially, we're thankful for Susan and her willingness to answer the call to ministry and today to step into this role as proclaimer of the gospel in your church. I pray for all of us who are watching by video that we would tune our hearts to yours. We ask you to speak to us as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We come together to sing our praises to the Lord and to acknowledge him as our Messiah. We'll sing together, He is Lord and blessed be the name. I'll be reading from Luke chapter 2. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary, 
took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And it is, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated unto the Lord and to offer a sacrifice keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him to his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him, and then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against him so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old and she had lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage but then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but spent, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying, coming up to them at the very moment she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. And when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. marvelous text that Lisa read a few moments ago comes from Luke's gospel. 
There's a long-standing tradition among New Testament scholars that Luke's gospel relies on Mary's memory. It makes this story especially sweet. Only Luke tells us the story of the trip that Joseph and Mary make to the temple 41 days after Jesus was born. They lived just six miles away in the little village of Bethlehem. Now there was a long-standing tradition and in the law of Moses that this trip was necessary. Back during the Passover, during the days of the ten plagues and the bondage in Egypt, at the Passover, the firstborn child of the Jews was spared. And so the law of Moses said every firstborn son belongs to the Lord. But a sacrifice would need to be made to redeem that child back into the family. The book of Leviticus in the 12th chapter tells us that the mother was to bring a dove and a year old lamb to be sacrificed. But Leviticus says, if the family could not afford the lamb, the mom could bring two doves. That's a significant difference. A few pennies for a dove, several dollars for a lamb. The fact that Mary and Joseph brought the doves tells us something. They are bringing the sacrifice of the poor. In the chaos of the temple, can you imagine how bewildering this experience would be for Joseph and Mary? They're carrying their newborn baby. They have their sacrifices. The temple is probably crowded. And an old man comes up to them. We don't know whether they ever had seen Simeon before. But he took that baby into his arms. And holding baby Jesus, he looked up to heaven and he said a prayer. The prayer is called the Nunc Dimittis because in Latin those are the first words of his prayer. Now let your servant depart in peace. Simeon says, I can die at rest because I have seen the fulfillment of your promise. Simeon saw what so many others could not or would not see. That God was at work in this little baby in remarkable and incalculable ways. Simeon recognized the true identity of this baby. This is God's own child. And this baby is meant to be a blessing to all the people on the earth, not just to the Jews. This baby will belong to the whole world. Simeon also knows something else, though, that this baby comes at a tremendous cost. This child is not good news for those who want to limit and control the Spirit of God. The religious officials in Jerusalem will not be happy at what this child will become. God is moving in amazing ways, but many will oppose this new movement. And... This baby will cost this mother more than she can imagine in her own suffering. As Jesus will one day suffer, so Mary will suffer. Luke says that Mary and Joseph marveled at what was said about him. But there's more. Now, an old woman, 84, not old by our standards, but by biblical standards, this woman had gone long past the age of average death for folks in that time period, in that part of the world. She's a lady preacher. Luke calls her a prophet. And she comes and she speaks up a message for everybody to hear, men and women. She is saying to them, there is, this is a premonition of the ministry of Jesus that she is proclaiming that God is at work. Everyone should pay attention to what God is doing. Anna is a model of prayer and devotion. 
She has been waiting for this moment ever since she was a widow. She couldn't have predicted when or how it would come, probably never imagined that it would come in the form of a newborn baby. But she knew. Like Mary Magdalene later, who was the very first to proclaim the resurrection, here we have another woman's voice, Anna, preaching the gospel of good news to anyone, male or female, who would listen to her in the temple courtyard. This was her sermon. Y'all look over here. This is God's baby. God is doing something wonderful in this baby's life. So what does it mean to bless someone? Myron Madden says to bless someone is to give them the gift of power, to set them free, to accept them for what they are, not for who we want them to be. He says when you bless someone, you have that special kind of sparkle in your eye when you see them or when you're near them. Dallas Willard says it's the projection of good into someone's life. You ask God to walk with them, to protect them, to guide them, to encourage them, to listen to them, to be in the moment with them, just to love them for who God made them to be. So for Simeon and Anna to bless Jesus, and I think to also bless Mary and Joseph as his family, to recognize that their son was the long-awaited Messiah, to just know in their hearts that there was something special about this child. I mean, if you were Mary and Joseph, wouldn't you have wanted that? Wouldn't you have needed that even, maybe? I can imagine maybe that Simeon and Anna had that sparkle in their eyes when they first saw Jesus and Mary and Joseph. What must that have been like? I mean, can you imagine the feelings, the power, even the freedom that might have come when both Simeon and Anna gave their blessings? You know, we have our family dedications, or we have here in the past. Many years ago, they were just called the child's dedication. But it's not just about blessing a child, it's about blessing the family from which that child came. Even at a young age, when we look at the children that come before us with their families to ask a blessing upon them, do we see beyond their cute little outfits? Are there sweet little faces? Do we recognize and do we see them for who God has already created them to be? So as we heard in Luke 2, Jesus was blessed. And so in turn, he blessed others, as you might expect, both children and families, young and old. If you recall in Luke 18 and a couple of the other Gospels, Families were bringing their children to Jesus to be blessed, just to have him touch their child. Imagine in your mind if you could have been one of those families. You had heard about this great man, Jesus, and all you wanted was for him to bless your child or your children. Can you imagine how that would have felt? To know that Jesus looked beyond the child's appearance and where they came from, their current status, their faith beliefs, to see the potential that was already in that child. I can only imagine that it would have been an incredible experience. So for me, I'm reminded that a part of my calling as a Christian, not just as a minister to children and families, is to bless children. Do we know that all of our children today that are both here inside these walls and outside these walls 
are being blessed by an important adult in their life. It seems that our children today have more and more pressures on them than I can recall having as a young child, even into my teen years. Sure, there were expectations and there were pressures and there was stress, but we didn't hear about it and we didn't talk about it quite as much. Today, our kids are diagnosed with anxiety disorders. Everybody's given an ADD or an ADHD diagnosis, it seems like. Depression, social media, and technology. What is that doing to our children? Suicide numbers for young kids, teenagers, are up. Traumatic s stress experiences is a new uh, phrase that we hear a lot about today. Experiences that affect children throughout the rest of their entire lives. By middle school, you know they're already getting the pressure to decide upon what college they want to go to. They are already expected to some extent to know what career path they might want to follow. Not even talked about the extracurricular activities that our kids participate in. Now, none of those things are in and of themselves bad. Of course not. But who's blessing these children when all of this is going on in their lives? You know, if you recall, Hillary Clinton said it takes a village to raise a child. Well, Cobbin stole from somebody, he doesn't remember who, that it also takes a church to make a village. So what's our role as a church and as individuals when it comes to blessing children and their families. I remember as a child and into my teenage years and even today, people in my life who blessed me. Sure, my family, uh, a childhood pastor that I loved and adored, some elementary teachers that I still can recall by name, and some Sunday school teachers. But there's a couple that I just want to mention by name and tell you why I mention them by name. Miss Martin, she was a family friend, and Miss Claxton, another family friend. These people had known me all of my life, and they blessed me in probably more ways than I've ever even told them. One is still living, and one is not. But they blessed me with their encouragement, their interest in my life, just a hug asking me how I'm doing on any particular day. Both of them, I recall, gave me opportunities for ministry. And they certainly gave me their grace. They shared their faith and words and the way they lived their lives. And they helped me to see Jesus. And more than that, they helped me to see that he had a plan for my life. They saw behind and beyond the exterior of a very shy, quiet girl with very few friends. And they saw me as special and as a gift from God. They saw the potential, the potential in me, even though I certainly did not. And their blessing continued um, throughout all of my days, even when I moved to Kentucky, they were still encouraging me and helping me to know that God did indeed have a plan for me. You see, it was their blessings and many others that helped me to find my calling. Susan reminds me of uh, a lady in my life, Miss Ava Nichols taught the junior boys at the Fairgrove Baptist Church in Fairgrove, Missouri. And Miss Abby, we called her. She taught the junior boys by herself, and we adored her. She kept a running list of all of her junior boys. We were always Abby's boys. And when Miss Abby died, we all served as honorary pallbearers, and I did her funeral. Miss Abby blessed us with her time, and by loving us, even though we were, in fact, junior boys. Anna and Simeon were able to do something very few of us can do. 
They looked beyond what was in front of them and saw what God was doing. Everyone else just saw another poor couple bringing a sacrifice worth just a few dollars, maybe even just a few pennies. Practically nothing compared to the lambs and the oxen that other people were bringing. We can imagine that their poverty was obvious. They were young, maybe nervous, maybe felt out of place. Were they scared? Were they bewildered? Honestly, they were just expendable, common, plain. But Anna and Simeon saw they were carrying the grace and mercy of God in their arms. They were able to look beyond the circumstances and see God at work. How easily we discount people who don't look like we expect them to or need them to or want them to. They are too young, too old, too skinny or too fat, too poor, too rich, too religious, too worldly. And we pass right by the miracle that God is revealing. That young couple over there may be raising a little boy who will one day be a blessing to the children at an inner city elementary school. That surly teenager that you walked past may channel her anger into righteousness and bring the blessings of justice and peace to her community. That widow sitting alone may be spending her days in prayer for you and is asking God to heal and bless you. That toddler who right now is downstairs in the church nursery may one day be the firefighter who pulls your granddaughter out of a car wreck and administers life-saving first aid. That third grader who stuck her tongue at you and no one saw it but you may one day be the caregiver that sits with someone's grandmother in the final hours of her life. To look past the circumstances of today and see what God is going to do in the lives of others requires something both Anna and Simeon had. Holy imagination. For years, decades, they had been practicing holy imagination. They had been looking past the obvious to imagine the hand of God at work. They laid their pessimism, their prejudices, their anger aside to see what God was doing and to see what others couldn't. That God was at work in remarkable ways. But it took practice and intention and desire. This message today is a call for you to do the same. To let go of the obvious, the outward appearance, and imagine how God will use each person that you meet. And when you see the potential in each person, your whole perspective changes. You see blessings where others see disasters. And your words of encouragement and your smile of blessing may be what makes the difference in their world. So I think one of the things that's important for me from this message is to ask myself, how can I be a blessing to children? Whether it's here or outside these walls, what is it that I can do? What is it you can do? if you're willing to take upon that challenge. This morning, we've placed uh, every one of our children's names that are here in the church, both preschool children or all preschool children and youth, uh, on a heart that you'll find lying here on the communion table. So after the service, if you're willing and interested, if you would like to take one of these names with you and just make a commitment to pray for this particular child, especially in the days and even in the months and the years to come, we think that that's a tangible, visible way 
that you can choose to bless a child. What about a birthday card? How about an encouraging note to our children? As Brother Jim said, a simple smile goes a long ways for many of our children. Do you often take time to have conversations with them? To ask them about the outfit they're wearing or the what appears to be new tennis shoes? Do you ask them how their week has been at school? Building those relationships and taking an interest is one of the best ways that we can bless a child. We can celebrate milestones with them, their sports events, their school events. And another important tangible way is to share your faith and to let them see Jesus in you. And when they see Jesus in you, they can fully begin to understand or they can begin to understand who Jesus really is and how he can impact their own life. I think our calling is to bless children and families. And guess what? For some children, whether here or outside these walls, we could be the only person that bestows that blessing upon a child. I hope that we will commit ourselves to be like Simeon and Anna to children and say loud and clear that you are a blessing from God and that you have a calling and a purpose that God has bestowed upon you as well. Amen. What a blessing it was to me to share this sermon time with Susan, and I know that she blessed your life too. I want to encourage you to communicate with us. I know we have friends who are watching across the country. Know that we think of you and we hear about you. Feel free to email me at jcobbin at fbcmtown.org or call us here at the church at 502-245-7889. We would be honored to know that you're part of our extended church family across the country. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, how wonderful it is when we see the people that you are calling to service, men and women, young and old. Lord, thank you for looking past the exterior and seeing our hearts. For we love you, Lord. And like Simeon, our desire is to serve you. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.